So, how you guys doing? I know now you came up here, uh, and we had it all set up that we were going to do some kind of interview, because uh, I just found out around six weeks ago that I had AIDS, and uh, took a couple of tests. They were absolutely sure, so, and I know you were planning that you wanted to do an interview with a lot of people uh, who were sick, and seeing how they were going, and everything was fine up until around two days ago, and I was all set to do that. However, a little change came about from a couple of things that happened recently. Number one, since they told me that I've been sick, uh, this, this really, this gut, gut feeling that, that somebody caused this somehow. This is some kind of germ warfare, CIA, something. I don't know. I'm not going to try and intellectualize it and tell you this happened when and this happened then, but I just got this feeling that I'm a victim of this bullshit that somebody went around to cause, to please their own insane reasons somehow. And they were declaring war on this whole group of people. And, uh, and the idea of me being the victim just really doesn't sit well with me. And somehow, so I was planning to do this whole thing for you now, and uh, somehow I just think I got to do this other thing. And let me tell you what really, what really triggered this off. The other night I was watching TV and the news, they had a whole bunch of people down at City Hall trying to get more money f for people who were sick and for some kind of research to help try and solve this problem. Then, while these people with AIDS were down there demonstrating for, for more money peacefully with permits, the whole trip, a bunch of young Republicans with shirts and ties. They may have come from Wall Street. They were some Christian fundamentalist church. Came down with big signs yelling, you people got AIDS because you fucking deserved it. And that's this message I came away from watching this thing and trying to prepare what to say for you. And in this head of people saying, you got what you deserved. Somehow, I don't see myself hanging around and going through all of this uh, pain and suffering to prove to anybody somehow that another gay person is another victim in this society. Somehow, uh, I'm not here to confirm that in any way. So, I thought I was going to change it and really make a statement that was going to interest me somehow, a little epitaph. So, uh, again, this is only because I got this feeling that I was a victim, and it really, really turns me off. So, being a person who's always lived by the sword in the sense that you're going to die it by the same way that you lived, I've always been an asshole in one sense, so there's no better way to go out, I don't think. Huh? Let me see what you think of this. Now, I want you to really, really take a look at my asshole, all of yours. So now, I want you to see my asshole, huh? You can see it? You can see when I put this up there? thing I got to say for anybody who cares my final words yeah the death of an asshole by the asshole right me the asshole my collective tongue your hungry tongue that groped around there seeking with enthusiasm with the porridge at the same time worshiping at the mirrored altar of the asshole the dog Hands like glass tentacles reflecting back to you, your own asshole, your own tongue, your own smell intoxicating you further into dropping even unknown barriers and that thrill of that time stop moment 
that exuberance, that genuine burst of lust. For who? For you. For yourself. You were looking for you, and I got in the way. You wanted to suck and fuck yourself, and I got in the way. All you could say, I wanted my own dick inside my own asshole, and you got in the way, and you did. Oh, yeah. The asshole as ritual object of worship. The asshole as the field of battle, as the killing ground, the cemetery, the true descent into the nether worlds of the self to lower and lower and lower yourself down, to lick away at the darkness, to suck and fuck away all the evil, to penetrate the dark corridors of hell, to fuck your own devils on their ground with their rules, no rules, to be fucked by dicks and demons, dicks of demigods, to be fucked to death by death, yeah, to fuck death is to master death, you give it orders, you tell it when to come, you see, death is your slave, even while it is your master. smile let's just say it was interesting this was a performance by the New York artist Emilio Cubiero You know, I've always, I've always embraced something about anonymity. I mean, I've loved anonymity. And it's something that comes out of being homosexual, moving through a very aggressive and dangerous landscape, which is, you know, the city you're born into, the suburban area you're born into, where you have to carry the silence of what your sexual orientation is, what your leanings are, because there are people out there who will murder you. And so it, somehow in the midst of that, I, I began to enjoy something about this the self-silence and the self-anonymity where I could travel across America, hitchhike in a car where I'm picked up by a cop who, if he knew what I thought for two seconds, would shoot me on the side of the road. You know, I want to confront that and I don't, you know, I don't want to be anonymous about this. People should witness things. They should, at the, at the very bottom level, be witnessed. This visual collage is part of a film by David Wojnarowicz, one of the most important artists with AIDS in New York. After having lived in the city streets from the age of 12, David became very famous in the East Village art scene in the 1980s. His paintings, films, objects, and writings often reflect his gay experience. Now, as a person with AIDS, David brings to his work his sense of limited time and his rage against ignorant politicians and an uncaring society. Uh, I remember being in the room when, I, when he died. I was with... Uh three other friends and we were sitting around his bed and uh, it was Ethel Eichelberg. I said, David, look at Peter. And I turned my head and looked at Peter and um, he was completely still. And then there were these two very long, deep breaths that were very gentle and he was gone. Yeah, I, I met Peter back in about 19, uh, 1980 and um, I was very, very fucked up. I mean, I, I was bringing with me all my experiences of living on the streets. I'd been off the streets for a period of time, but it was fresh in my head. Uh, we started out as lovers uh, very briefly, and uh, the feeling between us was very intense, or the, the connection we had. He encouraged me basically to, to do the things that I do at this point, which is to make things, to create things. At first, it just seemed, uh, it was extremely frustrating because uh, I felt extremely alone without him being around. And, um, 
And I, you know, and at, at first I found it very hard to uh, be able to express what I felt with anybody, because usually I would always express what I felt to him. Um, as far as the, the what the experience of illness is, I mean, uh, this is a vicious disease in the sense that it can never be charted. Its course can never be charted because for everybody that I've known who's died of it and everybody I've known who's ill, it's completely different. Across the river from Manhattan in Brooklyn lived the artist Raoul Gamba. We learned about him in a book called A Hundred Legends, a collection of artwork by people with AIDS. After several vain attempts, his brother finally agreed to show us Gamba's work. This is my, one of my brother's paintings. When he came out of the hospital, he, was, he got an inspiration for this painting and where he was in the bed and he's looking up at Christ for strength. This ray you see here is a ray of, of hope and strength that he's getting from God. And if you notice, the bed is on the yellow. The yellow symbolizes life. But if you see, there's the, the, the darker colors symbolize the death. And he's very close to it. But, not, but right now, he's still holding on. And his heart, if you notice here, is like it's trying to burst out because of all, all the, the, the suffering and the emotion that he feels. And he's looking up to God for that strength. This is my brother. My dear brother. Sometimes I get angry, saying, why, why did this have to happen to him? But there's, there's, there's really no answers. These, these things don't have any, any answers. The only thing is that you have to be careful. You have to watch it, because it's real, and it's deadly, and it kills. This one here is called Talking Heads. And what it is, this is the most important painting of everything. And where he's, this is him infected. And he's trying to cross this barrier, that this line here. And he's trying to get across to people who are in the high risk group to tell them to be careful. And these heads here, they're talking about the people who have died already, which are these down here. And around are the hieroglyphics of what's happening not only here, but all around the world where people are dying all over. It's incredible because this is my brother's dream come true, that his paintings be exposed to the world. His life, he died, it was a tragedy for all of us, especially for me. Matter of fact, it was, it was too difficult for me to, to deal with all the situation that I had to deal with at the time when he was sick, taking him to the hospital, going to intensive care, bringing him food, seeing the way they treated him because being blind, they didn't know he was blind, so they'd come and leave the food there, then I'd come and go, where's my food, I'm hungry. It was just all so, so painful, and, and the way I dealt with it was that I pretended that it wasn't there. Death, I had never dealt with death. And to think that my brother's not here, I, I, can't, I can't. I can't think about it because I can't accept it. How could my brother, someone that I love so much, that he was such a good person, he's just not here no more. Totally, 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 not only that, he was young. If he was an old person, I didn't say he lived his life and everything. But one good thing about it was that my brother did everything he wanted to do. He wanted to become a fashion designer, he did that. He wanted to have his own company, he did that. He wanted to be in all the newspapers, that pu pu publicized in, in the best magazines, he did that. This was a very special painting in where my brother knows that he's sick and he has, the only way he can turn to is back home. And what it is, is like he's going back into his mother's womb, looking for support, for love, for strength, because there's no other alternative but to go back. Fortunately, my mother was there for him, but I know of many, many, many that the families completely neglect. This one here is called Lovers to the End. What it is, he told me about this, these two lovers that they knew they were sick and they, they committed suicide together. And what it is is that they were still alive and they still had a lot of life because the path they're on is still with life. Yet they, they took their lives because of the pain that lied ahead. We didn't really accept it. It said like we knew it was like that and we just would, would deal with it, but we really didn't accept that he was gay. We really didn't. Was it difficult for him to be open about it or could you talk to him about it? 
You would say that. He just says, I would try to talk to him about it and find out why he felt that way or why. He just says, he wouldn't, he wouldn't know what to tell me. He would tell me these. I would talk to him about it, and he would, he would try to explain it to me, but I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I really couldn't. I, I accepted him, I loved him, and there's come time, a point in your life, and where you have to accept things, and you can't understand everything, and you can't try, because what happens is, you can't. There's things you can't understand. Just like AIDS, AIDS you can't understand. It just happens. This guy I know was walking with a friend of his around West Street one time, and they'd gone into one of the bars and had a beer, and after they left, they were walking down the street when this car from Jersey cruised by. Kids come around all the time throwing bottles and screaming, queer, and then taking off. So this car cruised by him real slow, and some kid leans out the window saying, suck my dick. My friend flipped him the finger and said something, and all of a sudden the car slammed on the brakes, and five kids came piling out the doors and started kicking the shit out of my friend. For the next 10 minutes, about 100 guys came from out of the bars and from around the corner and surrounded these five kids beating the shit out of my friend. His friend took off right away, and later my friend found out he just run home, didn't bother calling the cops or nothing. And all these guys crowding around, all these guys watching five guys beat up one guy, and none of them said or did a fucking thing. And my friend said the five kids stomped on his head and chest and broke a lot of his ribs and stomped on his legs. And at one point he got up, one point he got up and tried to break through the crowd to get away, but the kids grabbed him by the hair and pulled him back in. And he said it got to the point where he could hardly feel him hitting him. They were jumping up and down on his head and arms and legs. And finally he said he remembers jumping up, plowing through the crowd and running and running. And his face was just a puddle of blood. And the kids chased after him, but he ran faster and faster and through the streets and out of the neighborhood. And he kept running until he collapsed somewhere on some side street. And later he woke up in a hospital, found out he'd been unconscious for about six days. And the doctors told him that he was found by a bunch of cops, unconscious on West Street, surrounded by a bunch of guys who didn't do nothing. And apparently he had hallucinated the whole thing of getting up and running away. And he had never gotten up. He'd never gotten up. And the kids from Jersey got away before the cops got there. Well, when I re received a diagnosis uh, that I had this virus, it didn't take me too long to realize that I contracted a disease society as well. But I think what I really fear about death is the silencing of my voice and the inability of my body to move. And uh, that's the worst of it. And I don't believe in an afterlife or any other after stage of, of the body in terms of death. I feel that you just uh, a friend of mine once said pretty clearly that, uh, you know, when you die, you become fly food. And somehow that's comforting. There's, there's a thing of, of being public with uh, this virus, of having this virus, and saying to people openly that I have this virus. I mean, er, early on, as soon as I had this diagnosis and I started talking about it, I get from one of the dealers that I was dealing with in my paintings, oh, maybe it's not a good idea that you tell people you have this virus because then they, they're going to think you're not going to be around long enough to have a career, and therefore they won't buy your paintings. And it was like, you know, my answer to that was, well, they could also look at it that, you know, maybe I'll be dead in a very short time, and if they want something of mine, they better buy it now because, I'm, you know, there's a possibility I'm not going to be around long. So I feel this incredible pressure to leave something of myself behind. Peter, I, I want to talk to you about your art. Your drawings, your paintings, your book. Um, my art has always been an integrated part to my life, too. Now I have difficulties to do it because it's uh, difficult to work um, on the such constant with my eyes and my tiredness, you know. When I sit up for a long time, I, I get very tired. And uh, so things changed a little bit. Uh, I, I made a drawing uh, about three weeks ago, and I was actually amazed that I, I had to... I made it half in the dark, you know, and then I... 
had to hold it into the light to see uh, the details better. I don't even go to the eye doctor anymore because what good does it do her that it it got worse all the time, you know, and, and I have to pay $200 for that. Uh, you can express parts of AIDS, you know. AIDS is such a tragedy, you cannot express it all, you know. The anger and, and the agony and, and the sadness which is behind and uh, and strangely enough, I choose not to express these parts of it. I looked at the drawings the other day, and and they're uh, very sad angels I painted, or kind of young messengers who had, you know, who had a heaviness to them. I use them to think of them as healing tools to work things out, you know. And uh, it worked, I think. to a certain degree, you know. And he, being healed does not always mean being physically healed. It, it means being uh, spiritually healed, mentally healed, you know, like uh, that you have peace. Uh, I think I, I could die any minute and I, I'm not afraid of it, you know. I'm not afraid of fake fire <laughs> and hell and all that, the dismiss, you know. We create that in ourselves, you know. Two weeks after this interview, the Swiss artist Peter Kunz died in New York City in the arms of his longtime lover, Raymond. He lived long enough to see his last book of drawings published. Peter was a good friend and his death was a shock for all of us who worked on this film. Death and dying followed us throughout the work of shooting as did efforts of survivors to keep the memories of loved ones alive. Here in Philadelphia, we filmed one segment of the Names Project, which is a giant quilt made up of hundreds of pieces each representing a person dead of AIDS. At this time, we are going to begin the unfolding ceremony. John T. Seiler. Ron. Liberace. Dale Kramer. Hal Marritt. Rock Hudson. Philip Dimitri Gallus and my dear friend, Neil Spann. <laughs> I mean, this is about um, a thousand names here yeah. in Philadelphia, and, and when I saw it in Washington, it was about 8,000, and supposedly now it's up to 12,000 12, and growing, you know. Um, I think just overwhelmed with the fact that each one of these represents kind of the size of a person, you know, it's three feet by six feet. It's, it's about the size of a person with a name, personal artifacts, um, something about the person on it. And when you see so many of them, you just, you're just overwhelmed with, with the devastation of the disease. One of the men, uh, his family 
really never even wanted to acknowledge that he had AIDS. I mean, they just, uh, uh, I guess they had a sense of shame about the disease and uh, they didn't, it was very hard for them to admit it. And so I just felt that uh, somebody ought to come here on his behalf. It's real tough, real scared. What, what personally brought you here? Me. How so? How so? I've been positive for three years. I work very closely with this um, organization. And so it's a mixture of emotions for you? Yeah. Fear, and I've lost a lot of friends. Many. Many friends whose names are here? Uh, yeah, four of them right over there. <laughs> I'm not real good at this. Thanks a lot. You know, one of the things that I thought, if, if I die of AIDS, I don't, I don't want a fucking memorial. I mean, you know, I love the idea of the memorial. I love the idea that people pass information about somebody who's no longer existing to one another or to strangers so that they have some idea of the gesture of this person when they were alive. But I, I would rather that, and I told this to my friend Marion, that I'd rather, if I die, what I want is my friends to pick up my body from the hospital, drive to Washington, D.C., you know, break through the guards and the, uh, through the, the gates in the front of the White House and drop my fucking body right on the front steps of the White House. These are the people responsible for my death. Because they don't spend money for education and research? It's not my sucking dick that's responsible for my death or my getting fucked in the ass or any of these things. These people at this point are responsible for my death because of their inactivity and their total gesture of silence throughout eight years of this. This is a gallery exhibition of works by Don Muffet, who belongs to an artist's collective called Grand Fury. Using commercial advertising techniques with easily understood graphics and visuals, Grand Fury hopes to educate the public against homophobia and the lack of government funding for AIDS. The logo, Silence Equals Death, is a symbol for many artists who believe that in the midst of this horrible epidemic, the luxury of individualistic art has to be replaced with socially and politically oriented art. Because AIDS is seen as a disease attacking undesirable minorities, the United States government has responded with utter complacency. The result is grossly inadequate health care, an almost non-existent educational program, and a woefully underfunded research effort. This criminal negligence has forced the gay community to take action. If I had a dollar to spend for health care, I'd rather spend it on some baby or innocent person with some defect or illness not of their own responsibility, not some person with AIDS, says the health care official on national television. And this is in the middle of an hour-long video, people dying on camera because they can't even afford the limited drugs available that might extend their lives. And I can't even remember what this official looked like because I reached in through the TV screen and ripped his face in half. And I was diagnosed with ARC recently, and this was after the last few years a losing count of the friends and neighbors who've been dying slow, vicious, unnecessary deaths because fags and dykes and junkies are expendable in this country. 
If you want to stop AIDS, shoot the queer, says the governor of Texas on the radio. And his press secretary later claims that the governor was only joking and didn't know the microphone was turned on. And besides, they didn't think it would hurt his chances for re-election anyways. And I wake up every morning, I wake up every morning in this killer machine called America, and I'm carrying this rage like a blood-filled egg. And there's a thin line, a thin line between the inside and the outside, a thin line between thought and action. And that line simply made up of blood and muscle and bone. And I'm waking up more and more from daydreams of tipping Amazonian blow darts and infected blood and spitting them out the exposed necklines of certain politicians or government health care officials or those thinly disguised walking swastikas that wear religious garments over their murderous intentions or those rabid strangers parading against AIDS clinics in the nightly news suburbs. There's a thin line, a very thin line, between the inside and the outside. And I've been looking all my life at the signs surrounding us in the media or on people's lips the religious types outside St. Patrick's Cathedral shouting the men and women at gay parade, you won't be here next year, you'll get AIDS and die, ha ha. There's a thin line, a very thin line. As each T cell disappears from my body, it's replaced by 10 pounds of pressure, 10 pounds of rage, 10 pounds of pressure. And I focus that rage into nonviolent resistance, but the focus is starting to slip. My hands are beginning to move independent of self-restraint and the egg is starting to crack. America seems to understand and accept murder as a self-defense against those who would murder other people. And it's been murder. It's been murder on a daily basis for eight, count them, eight long years. And we're expected to pay taxes to support this public and social murder. And we're expected to quietly and politely make house in this windstorm of murder. And I say there's certain politicians that better increase their security forces. And there's religious leaders and healthcare officials that better get bigger dogs and higher fences and more complex security alarms to their homes. And queer bashers better start doing the work from inside howitzer tanks, because at the moment, the thin line between the inside and the outside is beginning to erode. And at the moment, I'm a 37 foot tall, 1,172 pound man inside the six foot frame. And all I can feel is the pressure. All I can feel is the pressure and the need for release. The artist Burn Boyle recently lost his lover to AIDS. Now, sick himself, he believes staying active is the best therapy. I've been doing photo postcards of my work for about 13 years. And now I also have a line of black Americana cards, Mexican art reproductions, you know, illustrating skeletons in all aspects of living, dressed up and, you know, having dinner, going to the store, you know, riding bicycles or whatever they're doing. Well, in the beginning of 86, I started this project, this art project. I was, because I was, you know, concerned about AIDS and, you know, people were dying and, you know, I was paranoid about it. Um, I started this project doing a photo booth picture, self-portrait of myself, one, at least one a day, every day of the year. That was started in January 1st, and by March, um, that was when I found out about my diagnosis. After I got diagnosed, it took me maybe six months before I told anyone. I was very uptight about it. I felt so isolated and such like a pariah or something, you know. I mean, I would feel guilty going to the bathroom in somebody's house, you know, because I hadn't told anybody, I felt so guilty and awful. So it was, um, I don't know, it was weird. I wanted to have a document of me, you know, at this time, because I was having this awareness that you never know what's going to happen. While I was doing the project, photographing myself every day, um, I tried to do different, different things. In April, I did a, a similar strip every day for the whole month. And in the beginning, I, I was clean shaven, uh, black and white, four strip. And then I grew a beard in the photo booth machine. And in the middle of the month, I had a cataract operation, which was also instigated because I got my diagnosis. I had been kind of blind in that eye for a while. But I thought, I don't want an eye operation. That really scared me. But when I found out that, you know, I had AIDS, I thought, well, you know, I can't see out of this eye. You know, what am I going to lose? Well, I've been very lucky. Um, when I got diagnosed in 86, they told me I would have 18 months and that I should start chemo right away and that the 18, it wasn't going to be a good 18 months. And now it's almost, it's three years later and I haven't, 
um, been sick. I have the Kaposi sarcoma skin cancer, and that's increased a little bit, but it's been pretty under control. I mean, it is slowly moving, and I'm aware of it, and, you know, but um, I haven't had a major medical problem. I feel really good, you know, and I feel like I'm busy with my, my work and, and studies, and, and I did go to a um, support group for about a year and a half. You know, it's kind of a group therapy in a way. All gay, all yeah, it was all gay guys with AIDS, and there were ten of us in the beginning. And then after a year and a half, the tenth, the ninth one died. Everybody died. Nine, you know, one through nine. I was the one that was left. Although we replenished the group, the original ten, I was the only one that was left. One of the biggest social events in New York in the spring of 89 was the Love Ball, sponsored by DIFA, an organization of designers to help raise money for AIDS. Elizabeth Taylor was in the forefront of celebrities who devoted time and energy to raising millions of dollars of private money for AIDS causes. Among many others have been Brooke Shields, Shirley MacLaine, Margot Hemingway, Robert De Niro, Tony Randall, and Sophia Loren. A Night at the Circus was one of the earliest successful benefits in February 1983 at Madison Square Garden. Among unusual events have been stripping for AIDS and jogging across the United States for 20 months to bring understanding of AIDS to small towns. Legendary Alan Buxbaum, a leader in high-tech architecture, died at the University Hospital in Manhattan of AIDS. He was 51 years old. Lloyd Wasser, chorus leader at the Metropolitan Opera, is dead at 49. Charles Ward, a leading dancer with the American Ballet, dies at the age of 33. David Summers, actor and cabaret singer, active in the homosexual rights movement and AIDS education, is dead at 34. And have to go to Art director, art critic, painter, makeup artist, fashion executive. You know, I still have this incredible need for sex, incredible sex drive or, or attraction to, to men. And I find that, you know, now it's what I'm being pressured to do is the thing of being honest about carrying this virus and not doing something that endangers the, the other person. But at the same time, it cuts right through the whole structure of what sex has always been to me, which is fairly anonymous without biography, uh, something passionate, something where y you receive language through gestures, the hands on your body, or you know, tongue, you know, the tongue against your body, or 
licking somebody's arms or, you know, whatever. And now it's like suddenly you have to give a medical breakdown <laughs> of where your body is and then say, oh, can we go fuck, you know, which is almost an impossibility. I mean, because most homosexuals that I know that, uh, that are actively engaged in sex who don't know anything about whether they carry this virus or not don't want to know. And they don't want to know because they don't want to have to cut themselves short if they decide to do some sexual act. We found artist Keith Herring working on a mural at the Community Health Project, a self-organized gay clinic at the Gay and Lesbian Center in New York City. Recently, he came out as a person with AIDS. Keith, can you tell me how AIDS has affected your life personally? Um, I mean, that's a pretty big question. I mean, obviously it's affected everyone's life in New York, whether um, they're dealing with it directly um, or indirectly. I mean, with me, I mean, it's affected my life since 1982, 83, when the first people started to, before even people knew what it was, but when people first got, started getting sick and not knowing what it was. And, uh, and then by losing friends and by completely changing the, the scene, the social scene and the sexual scene and the night scene and the art scene, I mean, everything's been affected by it. How did it change the sex scene and how did it change the art scene? Well, obviously, I mean, it's totally, I mean, this painting is about nostalgia. It's, it's, it's not about anything that can happen now. When I got to New York, it was 1978, and it was the height of the baths and subway bathrooms and things like that, which now is totally impossible because safe sex is a necessity. And, uh, and I think everyone, pretty, everyone that I knew were changed, changed their sexual habits immediately as soon as they found out um, the risks that were involved in and what was happening. How has AIDS affected your work? Uh, first of all, doing um, posters and images with the safe sex image, which was really geared to a, a general public and to sort of prevent and educate uh, the next generation that's growing up and to, you know, prevent them from being involved in the same thing. Um, and then on a more um, political level, doing things like the ACT UP poster, which was more directly um, involved with AIDS activism and, and trying to sort of cut through a lot of the bullshit surrounding the whole, the whole thing. Safe sex is the intelligent response to, to deal with the situation. I, I don't think it's realistic to tell people not to have sex because it's not going to happen. And people aren't going to stop having sex, and especially uh, y younger people that are having sex for the first time in their life um, I don't think they should be scared out of having a choice of what kind of sex they want to have. You know, and they're still in the experimental stage. And so safe sex, I think, is a better alternative and a more realistic alternative than to tell people to abstain from having sex. Sphincter. I hope my good old asshole holds out. Sixty years, it's been mostly okay. Though, in Bolivia, a fissure operation survived the Altiplano Hospital. A little blood, no polyps, occasionally a small hemorrhoid. Active, eager, receptive to phallus, coke bottle, candle, carrot, banana, and fingers. Now, AIDS makes it shy, but still eager to serve. Out with the dumps, in with the condomed orgasmic friend, still rubbery muscular, unashamed, wide open for joy. But another 20 years, who knows? Old folks got troubles everywhere, necks, prostates, stomachs, joints. Hope the old hole stays young till death, relax. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, how did your sex life change with AIDS? Well, certainly, I had always liked younger men and straight men. Uh, I liked to be screwed, and I liked to screw both. But I got a little worried about it then. Although, I think uh, having so many um, affairs with straight men probably preserved me longer than if I had been a wild queen and been screwing wild queens. Uh, but uh, now, let's see, well, I use a condom if I'm going to screw someone. Although I've been tested uh, three years in a row and come up negative, but you never can tell. 
but I've, I've been uh, involved with some very younger, much younger people, uh, friends, and uh, I don't want it on my conscience to give them a problem. So I just make sure that my own, if I screw them at all, uh, if I can get it up, because I take a lot of high blood pressure pills, and that sort of leaves me <laughs> without much of a heart on, actually. Yes, th there is another consideration about uh, living with AIDS, rather than just dying with AIDS. The planet itself has AIDS. So there's uh, ozone layer depletion, acid, rain, brimstone, as in the Bible, sulfur in the air, and the greenhouse effect. There are lesions on the skin of the planet, uh, the desertification, deforestation, and uh, poison dumping, both in oceans and on land. The key problem is that the immune system of the planet does not seem to be able to repair the damage done by the human virus. And how do we bow out gracefully if we're not able to curb our wild appetites and practice safe sex with Mother Planet? Intercut with footage from David Wynorowicz's own experimental film, is his reading of his poem, Last Night. Music is by Diamanda Galas. This is the law of the plague, to teach what is clean and what is unclean. Last night I took a man home from the subway where he'd been standing against the wall in the graffiti-covered car in black cowboy boots, tight jeans, and a shirt open to the third button and sleeves rolled up to reveal a workman's arms and a couple of blue ink tattoos, and when we arrived back at my place, I sat on my bed and loosened his pants with my teeth while pulling apart each button on his shirt with my fingers. And I slid my hands beneath the edge of his t-shirt and let my palms slide up over his hard and warm belly, and as his t-shirt rode up, my arms without motion, there were two birds revealed tattooed in blue ink and flying the distances of his chest. And my tongue moved back and forth, tracing wet lines across his belly, and I slowly stood up and moved my tongue over his pale sides as I lifted his t-shirt above his head. And I could feel the smell of his underarms as my face rose up towards him, my tongue taking in the taste, then he laid me down on the bed, removed my shoes and pants while I played with his hard dick through his pants, and he bent and licked the inside of my legs and thighs and under my balls, and then laid up on top of me, pulled my arms up and around his neck, and he kissed behind my ears and licked across my throat and across my face and down the bridge of my nose to my mouth where he put his warm tongue in. And I got the secondary stages of AIDS and the man on the TV who looks like he's got a potato for a head is telling me and the rest of the country that I must suppress my sexuality. He, he talks about me in words that make me sound like an insect, carrier, infected, and when he shows pictures of me, I'm always bedridden and alone and on the edge of death, and he says I must suppress my sexuality whether I'm a man or a woman, whether I'm a homosexual or heterosexual, whether I have AIDS or not, and he says that since condoms are not 100% effective, I must not fuck, I must not suck, I cannot caress, I cannot have desires or fantasies, and each media description from his uninformed lips is that I'm a walk-in death, a walk-in receptacle containing skulls and horrible illnesses and cancers and death. It refers to me as nothing more than a disease with two legs and a killer dick with sperm like bullets. And he tells you that I'm on a mission of destruction. I'm on a mission of destruction because I insist I'm being regarded as a human being that has a need to explore sexuality. And he tells you that I'm, I have a secret mission to infect the entire world. You know, if I'm acting like a hysterical accident victim, that's important to me that I act like a hysterical accident victim. That's important to me emotionally. It's, it's something that I, that I can use as a vehicle to move to something else. But it's important that I embody that and I have the freedom for that. And I think, you know, that kind of gesture of taking over public places of, uh, and even escalating it to violence is necessary at some point. It's like, okay, we can go 20 years now with nonviolent demonstrations, laying down in the streets, getting carted away by the police, but what the fuck is that gonna do? If that becomes the norm, as things do once they hit media, things, people, after a while, live with things in their lives. So people can live with nonviolent demonstrations in their lives after a while. After a while, it's not gonna excite people or provoke people. 
or incite people to do something to, to create change. So what's the next step? The man on the TV is also the man in the newspapers. He's got a replaceable head. One day he could be a man, another day he could be a woman. He could have the face of a politician or the face of a doctor or the face of a research scientist or the face of a healthcare professional or the face of a priest with a, with a swastika tattooed on his heart. And each and every one of these faces say they are concerned for you because of my existence. And it's fucking ironic when it takes on the face of a family man who wants to protect his children because I am his child and I got AIDS. And I don't think having AIDS is something heavy. It's the use of AIDS as a weapon to enforce a conservative agenda. That's what's heavy. I mean, I sit in front of the TV and whenever I see Cardinal O'Connor or the mayor or Stephen Josephs, I mean, I have an imaginary gun in my head and I shoot them dead. It's like if I could have Amazonian blow darts tipped in poison, I'll spit it in their necks. It's like I want these people to confront this disease the way I'm confronting this disease, the way I embody it, the way I see my life rushing, you know, the end of my life rushing towards me like a train. And these people don't. The closer I get to my death, the closer I come to uh, various illnesses and, and the, the, the less and less that I can move uh, the more and more I feel f uh, feelings of extreme violence, whether it's taking a gun and shooting some of these people, whether it's going up to this fucking church on Fifth Avenue and shutting it down with a bunch of people, whether it's explosives wrapped around my waist so I can shut that church down. Homosexuals or intravenous drug users are expendable in this society, and AIDS is treated the same fucking way that homosexuals and drug users are. And that's why there's been this legal and social murder on a daily basis for eight long years. And in the face of this, in the face of this, I'll continue to explore my body and the bodies of other men and find the possibilities of pleasure and connection. And this will be done with responsibility and need. And this will be done with deeper understanding of touch and fantasy and areas of pleasure and still to reach, and I will not be silent about this, and I'll not crawl into a media grave and die quietly. It's like people treat this asshole cardinal, uh, you know, it, it's like these, these sacred boundaries of this building. It's a building made of stone. It's a man made of flesh and bone and blood and tissue. And they act as if, because there's this abstract idea of what religion is, of what God is, that this man is untouchable, and he's not. And this church can be shut down the same way he shuts down abortion clinics, the same way he prevents people getting information or making personal decisions about the, their life, he can be shut down.
a Nazi polite and die like a martyr and make your experience of my social death a quiet and polite thing. I'll celebrate my sexual expression and I'll celebrate the sexual expression of people who have been murdered by the government and the drug companies who care more about profit than life. And I'll resist your corrupt intentions of silencing me or castrating me with your lying media and politics and religion. And if I have to fuck with a gun by my side, I'll do that. And I'll organize and I'll speak loudly and endlessly and with a smile on my face and with pleasure in my mind and body and with no guilt, no guilt, no guilt, despite the pressures of the manufactured world.